And a lot of cities are shifting the way they talk about protected bike lanes um, to something like an urban trail network because of that multimodal aspect. You know, it's it might be people skateboarding or rollerblading. I've heard that's coming back now, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> so, you know, whatever you're thinking, whether you want to jog with your stroller, you know, it's, it's about opening up access for all of these different modes of transportation and recreation so that people can enjoy their cities. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Martina Haggerty, Senior Director of the Local Innovations Project. We're gonna be talking about the brand new initiative uh, called the Great Bike Infrastructure Project. Uh, it's a good one, so let's jump right into it with Martina. Martina, welcome back to the Active Towns podcast. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you again and always love coming on here to chat with you. Yeah. yeah. And I say welcome back because uh, this is your second time on the podcast. Uh, why don't you just take a, a quick moment to uh, tell everybody who you are? Yeah, it is my second time on the podcast. I'm an old pro now. Um, so I um, spent a long time and working for the city of Providence uh, for Mayor Alorza, most recently advancing bike infrastructure and other uh, planning and land use initiatives there. And that was the capacity in which I was previously on the podcast. And now I've transitioned to a new role at People for Bikes, which is a national advocacy group and uh, the trade association for the U.S. bike industry. And uh, there I am the senior director of local innovation and uh, help invest in local communities all across the country to advance bike infrastructure. So it's really exciting to be in a position to help advance bike infrastructure in so many different communities of all different sizes and shapes all across the country. And that's what we're doing now, um, sort of thinking about how what that next investment is in places. Yeah, fantastic. So you said local innovations. Uh, talk a little bit about more about uh, what local innovations is uh, as a, a program, an initiative uh, within uh, People for Bikes. Sure. So over time, uh, People for Bikes, through their local innovation team, has invested in communities through programs like the Green Lane Project, which was responsible for welcoming the concept of protected bike lanes and green paint for bike lanes to the U.S. really and helped spread that across the country 10 or so years ago. Uh, other programs that we've run include The Big Jump, where we invested in about 10 communities across the country to accelerate bike infrastructure. Uh, more recently, The Final Mile was a program uh, through that office um, where we invested in five communities to accelerate bike infrastructure. And um, we also are responsible for other things that People for Bikes produces, like our city ratings program, um, which is really our, our measurement tool for progress in the United States, how cities are doing. Yeah, fantastic. And I'm, I'm scrolling down on the uh, the landing page for the People for Bikes website. And you had mentioned the Big Jump Project and also the Final Mile Project. And that's how you and I know each other is uh, because Way back when, in the day, I was uh, helping document uh, a lot of the activities uh, being done in in the area of of infrastructure and and taking a look at the the different uh, programs. And so, I was very much embedded with and involved with the Big Jump Project, uh, and had the opportunity to travel to many of those ten cities to document the types of projects that they had identified in their Big Jump. Uh, target areas, and then also with the final mile. And you and I had the opportunity to be on the same study tour in 2018 to the Netherlands. And that was a lot of fun. That was, that was a great trip. Uh, we do that a lot with the cities that we invest in. We like to get them to other U.S. communities to experience great bike networks, but also abroad. And there are a few better places than the Netherlands to really experience what great bike infrastructure can do for a place, for a community. Yeah. That actually reminds me too, I never produced a video for that uh, 2018 
a tour, study tour. So that might be something I should do. Um, cause originally I was kind of following all 10 cities, uh, and then the final mile cities thinking of doing a documentary, the docu never documentary never came to fruition, um, partly because of, of COVID happening, but also, you know, may, who knows, maybe that would be a fun thing to do a little, uh, mini doc on that experience and maybe catch up with some of the other, uh, study tour participants to see how impactful that experience was uh, for them personally, as well as for the cities. Yeah. Yeah. A little throwback documentary and uh, where are they now feature uh, would be great. <laughs> exactly. It was, I mean, you were there, you saw it. It was just um, those study tours are such a transformative experience for folks to really be immersed in a great biking city for several days, if not a full week. Um, and you come back with a completely new perspective on what is possible in the United States and in your own community. So um, I think a lot of those folks came back and, and were put to work in their communities and really um, helped transform them. So I'd love to see sort of a retrospective on how that worked. Well, actually, since we're, we're talking about that, how... Talk, talk a little bit about that, that influence that that sort of uh, study tour and other types of uh, experiential things has had on you in terms of, uh, you know, the fact that, as it turns out, now you're working for people for bikes. <laughs> so it must have been impactful. Yeah, yeah. If, if looking back, who knew, who would have thought um, that I'd be at People for Bikes now, you know, um, the city of Providence, while I w was there uh, working for Mayor Lorza, we received technical assistance uh, and funding from People for Bikes through the Big Jump program and through the Final Mile. And so we were one of the 10 cities in Big Jump, one of the five Final Mile cities. And um, both of those programs were, were really transformative. The study tour was really transformative. We also did some domestic study tours uh, with some other folks from the city of Providence. Um, that uh, were really instrumental in us being able to do what we did over the past 10 years or so in terms of getting a, a great bike network on the ground in Providence. Um, you know, I will say, going back to the study tour, one of the things that that shocked me and I this shocks everyone that goes on one of these is that, you know, a lot of these cities, uh, Amsterdam, et cetera, weren't always great bike biking cities. And so everyone kind of in the US, I feel like you get dismissed, especially at a public meeting or something like that. And people will say, we're not the, we're not the Netherlands. Um, they've always biked, it's in their culture, it's different, you know, and it's, it's not, it, that was like, for me, that was just mind blowing that that transformation was only in the past 30 years or so over there and that they were very car oriented cities um, and towns, much like U.S. cities. And they made a deci decision to transform and they made a decision to put bikes and people first over car access. Um, and so that was that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, they, they, just like many other cities around the globe, um, did cycle at pretty impressive numbers prior to World War II. Uh, but as you mentioned, after World War II, they really doubled down on uh, being car centric. And so they, they, you know, actually separated bike lanes didn't exist in large numbers in the urban environments there in, in the Netherlands, uh, so much prior to World War II, uh, but but people would just ride in the street, you know, prior to World War II, and not that many people owned cars. But when they doubled down on the car centric design and really doubling down on the number of cars, that's when yeah, it was shocking. It and and that's that's kind of the upheaval that took place in the early 1970s, as as you just mentioned. And they pivoted. They did, you know, they, they sort of said, hey, no, no, this is not the, the road that we want and need to be heading in. And so there was that pivot. And so it is very stark to see the uh, before and after pictures of the 1970s of what, you know, the Netherlands and, and other cities too, like Copenhagen, uh, you know, look like looked like then and then what it looks like now. So it really should be inspiration for cities globally and across North America to, to say that, you know, Hey, it, you know, we can strike a balance. We can start to work on some infrastructure, which becomes more people oriented and people friendly. Uh, let's, let's do this. Let's talk a little bit about that, 
that sort of evolution that took place is you mentioned the green uh, green lane project, which it was the project that was immediately before the the big jump, and then after the big jump, you had the final mile. Uh, really, the green lane project was about demonstrating that creating uh, protected uh, and separated facilities was a good thing to do. And Austin, where I'm at here, was a participant in the in the Green Lane project and then moved on to participate in the big jump and then moved on to participate in in the final mile. So they made they actually uh, were participants in all three of those major initiatives. Uh, for you in Providence, you were part of the big jump in the final mile. Why don't you define what big jump was about and then final mile what that was about since you participated in that. And then we'll shift to the evolution to now what you're calling the great bike infrastructure project. Good teaser there. Um, yeah, so the, the, the big jump uh, really was focused on specific geographic parts of, of cities. So there were 10 cities that participated in that. Providence was one, Austin was one, uh, New Orleans, um, I believe Fort Collins. There were a bunch of other folks from across the country. And it went from just demonstrating with the Green Lane Project one protected bike lane or a few in a city to show what they were like because there were so few in America that most most people didn't even know what on earth these things were. And so it was all about, you know, just getting single these singular projects out there. And the big jump, the, the main concept behind that was, was to say, okay, can we transform a specific geographic area within a city? And so for the city of Providence, it was uh, a part of our downtown um, and stretching into South Providence that where we were removing a highway. We removed or relocated Interstate 195 and opened up over 20 acres of land for redevelopment in downtown and uh, transformed what used to be a highway bridge connecting several neighborhoods into a bike and pedestrian bridge. And so that was the focus of our big jump initiative. And a lot of the other cities had similar focuses on specific neighborhoods or clusters of neighborhoods or corridors within their cities. Um, and the final mile really took it to the next level. The final mile was a program that said, OK, if we invest heavily in a city, in its advocacy and the supportive services and the staff that are helping make these projects possible to provide professional development opportunities and things like that, uh, can we rapidly accelerate the construction of an entire bike network across an entire city in two or three years? And so the five cities that participated in that program, um, which were, were Providence, Austin, um, New Orleans, again, stayed on for that program, Pittsburgh, and who am I forgetting? I'm forgetting somebody here. Uh, Denver. Denver. I'm sorry, Denver. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, so those five cities were able to construct more than 300 miles of all ages and abilities bike infrastructure as part of cohes a cohesive citywide network in three years, which was I think it was when we compared it to peer cities that weren't a part of the program. It was about three times as much bike infrastructure being constructed during that same time period. And so um, it was a really interesting experiment to say, because a lot of cities do these piecemeal bike networks, which, um, you know, they'll, they'll put a bike lane here or a bike lane there. And the idea here was, let's do the whole city at once, or as much of it as we can um, rapidly and just get it on the ground. And then, you know, we can improve on it over time, but let's get the network on the ground, bare bones, and then tweak it and edit it as time time goes on. That's an interesting uh, point that you're making is let's get something on the ground. Let's get a network on the ground. Let's accelerate this. Let's move it really fast. And what was interesting about the final mile uh, project uh, as a as an initiative in itself is there was a heavy investment in um, the narrative in, in the framing that went out. And so, uh, I don't know about in Providence, but in, in Austin here, I'd see billboards, you know, with framing, uh, 
you know, marketing and wraps on buses with framing. And really what it was uh, trying to communicate to the entire populace is that building out a a safe and inviting network for active mobility. I'm not even going to call it bike lanes, active mobility, because scooters are using it too. And people in wheelchairs are using it. So it's, it's these mobility networks and building out a network of active mobility options really sort of opens up a a whole new dimension of opportunity and choice for people. And it helps everybody. Even in, even in helps drivers. And, and that was one of the narratives and the framing that came out of that uh, was, in fact, this this is helpful for for everyone in the city, including you as a driver, because every person who's, you know, participating in using this mobility lane is another person not in a car in front of you. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, you know, it was uh, a huge component of the work that we did in Providence was reducing vehicular travel speeds on these streets. So a lot of these streets were very unsafe for pedestrians. We're seeing high rates of speeding. Uh, businesses were concerned about it. Residents were concerned about it. Uh, we were seeing higher crash rates. And so putting in protected bike lanes on major commercial corridors really helped to, to slow traffic and make those streets safer for everybody. Uh, we did a lot of neighborhood greenways or bike boulevards too, where we were uh, slowing traffic on residential streets where there were complaints and concerns. And um, it really was something or is something that works, works for everybody, uh, whether you bike or not. Yeah. Okay. Before we dive into that next evolution, which is the great uh, bike infrastructure project, let's uh, give a little bit of time to the other four or the other three uh, things highlighted under under infrastructure here. So starting over here at the BNA, the bicycle uh, network analysis, uh, give a little bit of of that context to what the BNA is all about. And uh, and I'm sure we'll we'll talk a, a bit about city ratings, too, because they're they're connected. Yeah, our bicycle network analysis is the the tool behind our city ratings program. So our city ratings program is the way that we measure progress on bike networks in cities and towns across the United States. And what the bicycle network analysis does, and you're actually, John, scrolling, as you're scrolling through our website right now, I know you're, you're showing some of the, the scores for some of the cities. And we've got, um, we're now updating those quarterly. Um, and so you're seeing some very fresh scores there as you scroll through. Ooh, and little sneaky, late breaking uh, news. The United <laughs> States has a new number one city there. Um, actually, what I think might be the best city in the world right now, Mackinac Island in Michigan was not have previously you, Have you been? I haven't, but now I have to oh go. Oh my gosh, right? it's <laughs> wonderful. We, okay, now that we're here and we see a 99 score, is this 99 out of 100? So it's 99 out of 100. So we analyze all cities on a score of zero to 100. And 100 is the best you can get. Uh, you can see the Hague on your screen is at an 89. Province down Massachusetts, which is a great little um, coastal community, has an 88. We've got, um, and now we've got Mackinac Island at 99. And so that score was just added, I think, last week. And obviously, that's a car free island for folks who aren't familiar with it. And so I was going to say, it's, it's, really well. it's a little. I was going to say it's a little bit not fair. It, it is a car free island. It's um, it, it is a wonderful success story in North America. It is in Michigan. Obviously, it's in northern Michigan, uh, just off of the lower uh, peninsula, just before you get to the UP, the upper peninsula. Um, and it's been a car free island since the 1800s. And so it actually, you know, very early on, they made that decision that it would be a car free island. And uh, there's only three or four motor vehicles on the island. I think one is the coroner and one is the ambulance. And But otherwise, you get around by walking, biking, or horse-drawn carriages. And most of the, the logistics, most of the deliveries are done by, by horse-drawn wagons. It's, it's a trip. It's a lot of fun. I was there in a, a decade ago in, in 2013, and I need to get back. So 
That's cool. I'm yeah, glad to see that. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, number three here is the future of, of mobility, five cities uh, paving the way. Uh, that's, that is the, the final model that we just talked about. So we don't need to talk about that anymore. Um, but really, as you mentioned, the BNA is the heart and, and soul of the city ratings program. So I don't think we need to talk any further about that because we just covered it under the BNA analysis, unless I'm missing something else on the city ratings. Uh, I, I think you've got it. You should really have our city ratings director on here on a future podcast. She uh, knows all about every component of it and how it, what makes it tick, how it works. And I know folks often have a lot of questions about why their city rated a certain score, uh, how they can improve their city rating score. And so we've got a lot more information about that on our website. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, Rebecca would be awesome to have on here. Sure yeah. People. And Rebecca and I have talked about having her on. So uh, I need to um, uh, circle back around to her and, and get that, uh, make that happen for everybody. So now we're on the great, uh, bicycle project or infrastructure project. Uh, so this is the new evolution of, you know, of local innovations going again from the green lane project to the big jump project and, uh, to the, the final mile. And, and by the way, folks, the reason why they called it the big jump is as Martina mentioned, we it, it was a focused on a geographic area and trying to make a big advance, a big jump in terms of the number of people who feel comfortable within that geographic location of being able to get on a bike. And so that's the, the origins of that name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the origins of project names are always interesting. Um, uh, so our, our new program is a really bold initiative called um, the Great Bike Infrastructure Project because we really do see this as a unique moment in time where um, this is sort of, sort of America's next great big investment. We've we've made a lot of big infrastructure investments as uh, as a country over the past hundreds of years and uh, you know we've we've built highways um, and other things and now I think with the availability of federal funding and the focus on repairing connections in, commu in communities sustainability equity getting uh, more people walking and biking and improving safety there's there's really more federal funding than ever available for biking and walking infrastructure. And we want to seize that moment. We want to help local communities and advocacy organizations jump on this moment and take advantage of that funding opportunity to build bike infrastructure everywhere. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned funding too, because uh, in fact, uh, People for Bikes as a, a, a nonprofit, as a, a funder, uh, you're not actually funding the infrastructure projects typically because you don't have billions and billions of dollars in your uh, account. But what you are doing and what the, the organization has been doing is, and you mentioned to, you alluded to it earlier with the big jump, is there's a lot of technical assistance and a lot of support. Reporting. And then with Final Mile, there was a lot of that infrastructure we talked about, the investment in uh, the framing and the marketing and helping the community build the, the, the local support necessary to be able to pass those infrastructure bonds locally. Because actually, if you can do what Austin has done, which is, you know, raise through multiple election cycles, uh, the funding necessary to build out their network and not have to rely on federal funding, all the better because federal funding typically is slower, takes a little bit longer. There's also always strings attached to it. And so although we appreciate the federal funding, it's even better if cities can really start changing the narrative and building the community support so that they can actually you know, start investing in dollars at the local level and move this a lot faster. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, it takes really we work across all three scales, national, state and local, and it takes funding from all of those levels to, to get the amount of bike infrastructure and, and pedestrian infrastructure that we need on the ground out there. It's going to take everybody. Um, and so, you know, and there's also, you know, when you go after federal grants, you need local matching, what they call local matching funds, typically federal government will supply 50 to 80 percent of a, a project's funding. You need to come up with the rest at the state or local level. And so through local bonds initiatives and other things, it's, it's really critical to pass more funding uh, for, for bike infrastructure. Yeah. So part of this project is and, and I was I was present at the 
uh, announcement of of this. Uh, and so I was I was uh, at the event here in Austin when uh, Jen Dice, the CEO, uh, you know, st- talked about this uh, uh, one thousand plus projects and. Uh, uh, and and that's part of what's audacious about this is you have this vision that uh, it truly is the great infrastructure project. You're talking about a thousand plus projects. So talk a little bit about okay, what do you mean? How, how is this? Are you 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 know? My gosh, did you come into a lot of money? <laughs> but so so explain how this is possible that a thousand plus projects are getting some level of support from People for Bikes. Yeah, that's a great question. And so obviously, I wish we were able to fund all of those those bike infrastructure <laughs> projects. Um, but, you know, at the center of this campaign is the, the goal to build thousands of bike infrastructure projects, both for recreation and for transportation uh, in cities and states all throughout the country. And uh, the, the list that you're showing on your screen right now is really, and the map is, are really at the center of that. And I know you're kind of, you're kind of scrolling through our interactive mapper on our website, which you can uh, zoom into, you can see specific cities or states, and you can click to see what kinds of bike projects are proposed or planned in, in your community or nearby. And um, these are, you know, thousands of projects that are in various stages of planning or proposal. So it might be something that is proposed in a plan by a community. It could be a project that is funded, but maybe a few years out. Maybe it's soon to be under construction. But they're all projects that need the support of folks to make sure that they get funded and built and stayed built. As you know, there's there's always that sort of NIMBY pushback at the last minute as a project gets, gets constructed, um, whether it's a trail project or uh, a, a protected bike lane. You know, people are always fearful of change, and uh, we want to make sure that folks are equipped with the knowledge of what bike infrastructure projects they should focus on in their community. Reach out to your local advocacy organization to see how you can support these projects and support their work in advancing these projects. Um, and that, that's really the goal here is to collect all of those in one place. There's really nothing like this out there. We looked and thought, well, if it's not out there, we should create it because how else are people going to know about projects that are happening in their backyard? Um, how else are they going to know the the right local advocacy organizations to contact? And so we're really um, pooling all that data together from all, all sorts of different sources across the country and making it available to folks. Um, and you know, when you um, click on a project on the on on the interactive mapper, it'll actually bring you a pop up box up that will show you the name of the project, uh, a little bit of more information about it. It'll let you. Uh, click on a link for more information uh, to learn about the project. And then it also lists the state and local advocacy organizations um, in your area so that you can reach right out to them and, and see what you can do to help. We do found you know that. Do you know where I'm zooming in? I, on I, here? I suspect you're zooming into Austin. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, not. Uh, that's boring. <laughs> that's boring. I, I, I know Austin. No, I'm, I'm kind of zooming in on Northwest Arkansas area, because I know you guys are, are you even have like an office now up in the Northwest Arkansas area, right? We do. We have a really cool office that you can, it's in a building called the Ledger that you can bike right up to. It has an external bike ramp. And right. anyway, that's where our office is there. Yeah. And we, so we have a huge focus on helping advance uh, bike infrastructure in right. Northwest Arkansas. Fantastic. That's great. And I see that uh, uh, the, you've got these tabs here where you've got the West, the Southwest, and Midwest, and, and Southeast and Northeast. So walk us through how cities get engaged and involved with People for Bikes uh, within the Great Infrastructure Project. So there, there are a few different ways for folks to get involved. Um, if you if you take a look at our list and you don't see a project that you'd like to see on our list uh, in your community, you could, there's a, a source through our website, through the FAQ page on the Great Bike Infrastructure Project page, uh, where you can uh, submit your projects or help us correct project information. And the main way that we are helping advance these projects, aside from just getting the information out there and encouraging people to, to help support these projects 
locally is uh, providing support for things like action alerts. Like, so when a project is going for a hearing for funding before the city council or the state legislature, or um, a mayor is threatening to remove a bike lane that was just constructed and it's one of these priority projects, we help issue things called action alerts in coordination with local and state advocacy organizations to our entire network to ask people to show up to the to the public meetings, to write letters, to call ele their elected officials, to take action and make sure that these projects get funded, built and stay built. Yeah. And that's a good, uh, uh, again, uh, y'all are nonprofit. <laughs> and so it's not like you're rolling in massive amounts of, of, of money to, to be able to do this. So you're, again, providing uh, a support that you can do, like support in action alerts and support, uh, as we were talking about earlier, in technical assistance and being able to, to help educate, uh, you know, or communities and populations, et cetera. You also sort of track each year uh, after each election cycle, uh, the, the, the bonds and the uh, you know, results of elections with regards to funding towards said projects. And so I know that that's something that, that comes out uh, in the literally the days, in, you know, hours after every election, uh, major election cycle, uh, there's there's sort of a posting that comes out from y'all about, uh, you know, the major wins that took place, uh, you know, across the, the country. Uh, so that's that's another sort of thing that you're doing in terms of when you talk about tracking these projects, you're also tracking, you know, sort of the zeitgeist of how things are going across the country. Yeah, yeah. Both in terms of getting these projects built, we'll be tracking the, the status of these over time and helping celebrate those wins. But uh, the other um Part that you've pointed out are um, our investments in supporting Vote for Bikes. We call it our Vote for Bikes campaign as like the local ballot initiatives that support support these projects that make them possible. And so that's, uh, you know, if anybody's interested in that, you can reach out to us through our website. Um, we, again, like to track those. We like to know what's getting funded out there, who's passing new innovative funding mechanisms to to build this kind of infrastructure. And we want to support it and ensure that we, we call it our PFB army, but our, our database of millions of people are supporting these projects in their own communities. Yeah. So storytelling is incredibly important uh, to all of this. And so I see that we have our transformative stories uh, sort of outlined here. Walk us through sort of uh, what is uh, all these transformative stories are all about. So transformative stories are all about exactly just that, telling the stories of these projects that give it that local connection. You know, people care about national campaigns, of course, like this, the Great Bike Infrastructure Project, Let's Transform America. We all love that. But what people really care about is the project that's in their backyard, that, they, that they're familiar with, that is going to close a gap in their recreational trail network uh, to make it safer and more accessible, to build a protected bike lane to help their kids get to school more easily. Uh, whatever the, the project is, we wanna tell those stories. Uh, we wanna celebrate those local advocacy coalitions and elected officials that are doing great things, doing the really hard work. And that's that's really the goal there is to, to to bring those to life so that people can understand the impact this has uh, on a very personal level for people. And I notice in scrolling through these, we see that some of them are proposed, some of them are funded, uh, some of them are approved. And so there's that status um, that we you sort of alluded to earlier, which is, okay, well, where where is this this project at? in terms of this. So that's part of the narrative of these success stories or, or highlights is, you know, yeah, this, this particular protected bike lane in Madison is currently at the proposed stage. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to help uh, rally that local support to get all these projects from proposed to approved, to fully funded and to built. Um, and, you know, we'll be there each step along the way to help, to offer advice to, to folks that are working on the ground in these local communities, connecting them with the right people, helping them figure out funding sources uh, and things like that. Yeah. Are there some stories that really 
have resonated with you, um, or I should say, I'm sure there are some stories that have really resonated with you. What are some of the stories that have really re- resonated with you uh, in, you know, from the first uh, few weeks of this being launched? Uh, you know, I think w- one of the the great stories that you, you scrolled through on the website there is the the Glacial Drumlin Connector project in Wisconsin. Uh, it's a trail project to connect a greater regional trail system. And uh, I really like this project because it um, is not only connecting trail systems, but it's connecting more people to the trail systems. And so, and making riding, whether it's recreational or for transportation, more accessible to more people is so, so important. Making sure that access to trailheads isn't just for people who have a car and and a bike rack, that you can get there with your family safely and easily from your house is going to encourage more people to get on bikes. And that's what we want. Yeah. I think that's an important thing that you just highlighted there is that a, many of these uh, facilities, many of these infrastructure investments, um, you know, can fall into this, this uh, sort of area where it is multi-use in nature. Uh, it, it, it's certainly this, tr- this trail is going to be a shared use trail. And so it's not, quote unquote, just bike infrastructure. It really is multimodal uh, types of, of infrastructure that's being, uh, you know, built out. And, you know, as I alluded to earlier, even our, quote unquote, protected bike lanes, really, we're, we're realizing that these are very essential for uh, people in wheelchairs, people on scooters and mo- other mobility devices. And so I think that's an important thing to realize that even though it's people for bikes and it's, this, you know, a bike advocacy initiative, really, we're, we're looking at active mobility and really more people oriented mobility options. It is. And a lot of cities are shifting the way they talk about protected bike lanes um, to something like an urban trail network because of that multimodal aspect. You know, it's it might be people skateboarding or rollerblading. I've heard that's coming back now, which is crazy. Um, (laughs) So, you know, whatever you're thinking, whether you want to jog with your stroller, you know, it's it's about opening up access for all of these different modes of transportation and recreation so that people can enjoy their cities. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Uh, again, another great example to of, you know, a, a success story in the in the making here and uh, really looking forward to, to seeing how how this you know kind of plays out. It also sort of highlights the fact that a network is oftentimes um, comprised of many different types of infrastructure facilities. Whereas, you know, when you look at an entire network across like the city of, of Madison, you have some good on-street network facilities, uh, which then transition to some off-street facilities and shared use paths, which then, you know, transition into, you know, an, another type of, of trail network or, or, or facility. And so it, it really isn't just one thing. It isn't just protected bikeways or it isn't just natural surface trails. There's, there's sort of this blending of different types of infrastructure that creates an entire network. Yeah. And that's what you want to see. You want, you want to see neighborhood greenways and bike boulevards reaching out into neighborhoods. You want to see protected bike lanes um, or separated shared use paths uh, on busy, busy roads that connect between those neighborhoods um, and connect to downtowns and things like that. And then, you know, shared use paths are, and, and trail systems are a huge part of that. And we're even looking at things like bike parks uh, and, and off-road mountain biking trails and things like that, because that's all, that's all part of the experience of having a great biking city that you have great places to bike and great places to bike to, uh, whether it's for your kids or for your own, your own recreation. Yeah. And, and you do bring up another good point there too, is that the, when you build out a city that is quote unquote bikeable, it serves more than just one purpose. I mean, back in the day, it, it seemed like, you know, the bike lanes, uh, when you were just talking about a painted bike lane, it just kind of served a very, very narrow portion of the population. The 1.5% of, of confident riders that, that that's all they needed. They just needed a painted bike lane and they'd do it. And, uh, it, and 
you know, that's kind of where we were stuck for many, many decades. And then the Green Lane Project came around and really the awareness of trying to create more all ages and abilities facilities. And then suddenly you start to open up the real opportunities, which takes us beyond just recreation. Because that's kind of where we were stuck in, is we were stuck in, a, in an area where it was just kind of recreation and then har- a few hardcore commuter, typical stereo, stereotypical commuter males that were confident and they rode, you know, and that's what they did. They were bike commuters. But in reality, what we're talking about is trying to open up to a, a, a much broader constituency, a much broader part of the population. Uh, In some cities, it's as much as 60% of the population that are interested, but they're concerned with their safety. And so if they had a safer network, then maybe they would ride their bike to the grocery store and maybe they would, you know, take the kids to school and to the park and to their friend's place. So that's what we're talking about here is, is being able to open it up beyond just recreation, nothing wrong with recreation, but making riding a bike being more than just that. Absolutely. And that's why we, we, I like to talk about it as an all ages and abilities network that, you know, it's, it's folks that could be an eight year old child, an 80 year old grandmother and everybody in between, no matter their comfort, comfort or experience riding a bike, uh, we want them to feel comfortable and confident to get out there and ride more often. And that's really what it takes is things like shared use paths or neighborhood greenways with slowed traffic or protected bike lanes to make that happen. And you're a parent, so you can you can speak to this very viscerally and and, and personally. I am. I have a 10-year-old who loves to ride his bike. He just talked me into getting a mountain bike, which is a whole new thing for me. I've been a sort of urban commuter type bicyclist. Um, I have an e-bike. My, I call it my mom e-bike with a, a cargo um, so that I can I can tote my son around the city for places where I'm not comfortable letting him ride his bike on his own. Parents out there know there's nothing more nerve wracking than watching, you know, uh, an eight to 10 year olds ride on a busy street. You just never know what they're going to do. You never know what cars are going to do. And having protected bike lanes, being able to ride to places where I don't have to worry about him and he can have that freedom to ride on a bike path. And I know he's going to be safe uh, is a game changer, um, both for him and for me. So (laughs) it's a win-win. That's that's fantastic. That's fantastic. (laughs) Is there anything that we haven't mentioned about the great uh, infrastructure project, a bike infrastructure project uh, that uh, you want to make sure we leave the audience with? In addition to our um, our list of a thousand projects, as we call it, that's going to help us build uh, this more bikeable nation, we're also offering through the Great Bike Infrastructure Project a series of legislative strategies to help people, whether they're advocates or policymakers, um, at the state, local, and county levels to accelerate the construction of bike infrastructure through legislation. And so, our our legislative guide offers a series of strategies that have been effective in helping states uh, and cities all across the country do just that. Yeah. And I can't emphasize this enough. I've seen it uh, over the years, uh, really the, the couple decades that I've been following this work, this matters. We need to, to really push for uh, policy changes and legislation and, and funding. And so getting this stuff right is, is absolutely critical. So this is a, a very, very important uh, resource to tap into. If you're here yeah. in, in, in America, you definitely need to do that. It is. And, you know, as much as we encourage people to work with local advocacy organizations and their local elected officials to make sure priority bike projects are getting built in their communities, please use our legislative guide to to advance legislation at the same time. Work with your local advocacy coalitions. Take a look at our guide. See what your community has, what it doesn't, what you think might work. You know, we have everything from more than a dozen different ways to fund bike infrastructure at the state and local level in there um, through, you know, things that you might be familiar with, like general obligation bonds that um, are often on the ballot, but also things like tax increment financing districts and business improvement districts. There are a lot of communities that are doing really innovative things out there and there's no need to reinvent the wheel So we put all of that together in one resource to help people take advantage of what other cities are doing, what other states are doing, and get it done in their own community. 
Fantastic. That is awesome. Yay. <laughs> So Martina Haggerty, the Senior Director of Local Innovations, thank you so very much for uh, joining me once again on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks for having me, John. It's always a pleasure to be here. And thanks for all you do to, to promote all this great work and get people out there and active and walking and biking around their communities. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Martina. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, it'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content, please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador. Uh, it's easy to do. <laughs> Just click on the link taking you to the website. And there's many different ways that you can support the channel, including uh, becoming Becoming a Patreon member. Uh, YouTube super thanks. Just click on the button right there, <laughs> as well as uh, buy me a coffee. And you can even make a donation to the nonprofit, as well as going out to the Active Town store, picking up your own Streets Are For People swag. We've got bottles, we've got coffee mugs, as well as t shirts. Uh, every little bit really does help and is much appreciated. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.